Amen. I want to keep doing what, what Pastor's been doing. If you can, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 27. And uh, he's, he's enculturated me to it. I, I like this thing about where we stand for the reading of God's Word. It didn't take a whole lot for me. I get it. I really get it. Matthew chapter 7. 27. 27, that's right. Matthew 27. And I'll start with verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water. and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am the innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. And one more time, Lord, I'm just asking God that you give us grace today, Lord, that we can receive a fresh word from you, Lord, that we can hear what the heart of God is in this portion of this passage, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let me see you. Appreciate that. So this is a portion of, of that popular story, well-known story that that is very often neglected and just grazed over the portion that deals with this, this criminal Barabbas. And, and before I get deep into that, I wanted to just briefly graze over just a little bit of history, just for the sake of a backdrop, just to kind of help give a little bit of what the culture was in Jesus's day. And I can't go very deep into it, obviously, for the sake of time and, and, and I just wanted to, to let you know that one thing that's very clear is that not, not all Jews were really devout in their faith. They weren't all very committed to the Jewish faith. Just as today, as we see, I, I work offshore on a platform in the oil and gas industry, and I talk to guys, and I meet guys out there all the time coming and going. There's the core crew that's there every time I go out there. And there's many guys out there that claim to be Christians but it just doesn't really show very well. It's hard to tell that they're Christians. Not everyone is devout in their faith. And then with the Jews of that time in Jesus' day, there were some that would have viewed the teachings of Messiah, Jesus, or should I say the Messiah that they were awaiting, as just bedtime stories. This had been going on, the prophecies they had been hearing about, they had been taught about, 
the idea and the fact that there was going to be an anointed one. There was going to be a promised one that God was going to send. He was going to be the king over them. And he was going to take this rule and he was going to conquer the rest of the whole world. And the whole world was eventually going to be in submission in some fashion or form to this Messiah. And it had just, they've heard this and it had been regurgitated through the portals of history all the way up until this time. And there were so many at that time that they just, it just wasn't real to them. They didn't really believe. And it was affecting their Jewish faith to where they weren't even really devout believers, followers of the faith that Abraham had brought to them, that Moses had presented to them in the commandments. And then so as time goes on in around 330 BC, there was Alexander the Great with his Grecian rule. He began his military campaign and conquered Persian, the Persian Empire. The Jews were under the Persian Empire. And Judea was part of that empire. They were under the rule of, of the Persians. And so Alexander conquers that and, and takes them for himself. And in 332 BC, Alexander captures Jerusalem. So he's got Judea, now he's got Jerusalem. And he introduces the Greek culture, which was known as Hellenism. And I don't want to get hung up on all that, but just Hellenism is just another word to describe the Greek manner of living, the customs and their values, what they considered to be valuable. And there were false gods and there was idol worship. And when rulers would come in, new rulers, new kings would come, they would cut the head off of some of these statues and false gods, and they would refashion a new head. It was cheaper to do that. And they would make it to where the head would look like the current ruler, the current king, so that they could receive that worship and they could re receive that honor. And so this was what was just a portion of the culture of the Greeks and the Hellenism. It influenced art, it influenced architecture, clothing, hairstyles, the food. It influenced every part of their way of life. And the Jews were brought under that and they were affected by that and they were infected by that. It had a huge impact on the Jewish culture as a whole. And then it's affecting and infecting Jews who were not devout in their faith, who were looking at these prophecies and these promises of God that Messiah was going to come, they were seeing it as just fables, folklore. It wasn't real to them. And so there was the worship of these Greek gods. There was worship of Greek goddesses. Then Antiochus Epiphanes, he comes. And when Alexander the Great dies, Antiochus Epiphanes comes onto the scene, the Seleucid Empire, and he starts his campaign and takes over the Grecian Empire and takes them under his rule. And so the Jews are now going under a different kingdom. And Antiochus had banned the Jewish rites and traditions. He defiled the temple. Many of you are very well aware of that history of what happened. That was during the intertestamental time between the time of the writings of Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament, from that time all the way until the birth of Jesus Christ, this kind of covers that period right there. And so what's happening is there's just more enculturation of the world. There's more enculturation of false doctrine and, and false worship of other gods. In 166 BC, there was a Maccabean result, revolt. It was the Jewish Maccabean revolt. And so it was a group of these Jews that came together and they had had enough. They had been so disrespected. The way that, that he was handling what, what he did to... Uh, desecrate the holy temple. They made an attempt to try to cleanse not just the temple, but the whole culture. And it seemed like it was working to some extent, to some degree, but it was a very short-term flourishing of this Maccabean era. And then in 63 BC, much later, was when the Roman Empire took over. And then the Jews had to come under the Roman rule. And so Rome had adopted a lot of the Greek ways and their customs and their culture and their gods and all of it, the worship of these false gods. And so it was easy for some of these Jews to just go from what they were under currently to what they were moving into. They were able to adapt. And you know how the world is. 
You know how the church is. You know how many people who call themselves Christians are. You know, there's a tendency for many to just adapt to what the world is doing, the way the world is changing, the way things are constantly evolving. And that's what was happening with many of the Jews. But in this group of, of Jews that were adapting and changing, there's always a remnant. There's always those there that are a part of the remnant that are faithful. It's usually a very small few that are truly faithful to God. And there was that. And so that just kind of gives you an idea when Jesus was born, when Jesus came to the world, that's what was the culture and that was the mindset. And there were still those devout Jews that wanted to maintain and they wanted to uphold the Jewish faith. And they wanted to have a temple and they wanted to have sacrificial uh the sacrificial system in place where they could worship God the way that God had commanded them to worship and to live for him. But they were limited as to what they could do. And then there's this governor Pilate, the governor of Judea, who was the one who, we read the story, he was the one who was judging Jesus's case. He would eventually carry images just to let you know the kind of character that this is. Knowing the Jewish faith, knowing all about it, knowing what they liked and what they did not like. Later on, even after Jesus' crucifixion, Pilate, the governor of Judea, would eventually carry images, graven images, into their Jewish temple. And he did it at night. He was trying to be slick, trying to be sly about it. And when they found out the next day, I mean, they went into the temple as they would every day, they realized, and it was this huge, massive uproar. But he was prepared. Pilate had mixed in some of his own people with the Jewish people, knowing that there was going to be a revolt. And they, were, they didn't have swords, they didn't have knives, they had clubs. And they started to club them. And they started to beat them. And, and, and it, it created this, this large stampede where they just are running and trying to get away. And people were killed from the clubbing. Some people were killed from being trampled on. This is the kind of person Pilate was, the kind of leader that he was. He was using temple money, Jewish temple money, to create an aqueduct, a, a water system, to get water to come into Judea and, and to give them a better source of water. And it, again, there was a, a, the beginning of a big, massive backlash, but he, he was always ready. He was always ready ready to somehow try to get control over what was going on. And so that just kind of gives you an idea of Pilate and what he was about and the, and the type of man, the type of heart that he had. But let's get to the story. In verse 11, it says that Jesus stood before him. He stood before the governor that was Pilate. And, and he asked him that one question. And in Matthew's account of this story, because it's also in Mark, Luke, and John, but in Matthew's account, that was virtually the only time that Matthew shows a conversation. When you look at the other Gospels, there was more conversation between Jesus and Pilate. But what, what Matthew focuses on is just this one question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered in an affirmative. He said, it is as you say. It's exactly as you say. But then all these accusations in verses 12 through 14, all these accusations are being hurled at him by the chief priests and the elders. They were the ones who were working hand in hand with Judas to get Jesus crucified, to get Jesus executed, to just get Jesus gone. They didn't just want to get him gone, but they wanted him to suffer in the process. And with all these accusations, every word that was spoken against Jesus, Jesus did not say one word. Not one word in his own defense. And in verse 14, Pilate is amazed. He's marveled. He's marveling at this. Like, who in the world goes on a witness, stands before a witness stand, and, and is, is being judged, and they know that they're innocent, and the judge knew that Jesus was innocent, and is, he's not going to say not one word in his defense while all these railing accusations are coming against him. And he doesn't say not one thing, not a word. 
in his own defense. Pilate was just like, wow. He had never, I believe he's never seen this before. Why would he be amazed? He didn't defend himself against anything that they were saying. Why? Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus not defend himself? Look at Joseph. Look at Joseph in Genesis 41.10. Joseph, the son of Jacob, when he went to Egypt, he was sold into slavery. You remember the story. And then he ends up in prison after he was falsely accused. And while he's in prison for two whole years, during that period of time, he meets a baker and a cupbearer, or a baker and a butler. And the cupbearer was the one of the two who was allowed to live and was taken out of prison and restored back into the king's palace. And before he left, Joseph told him, he said, hey, I need you to just remember me, and if you can, mention my name, mention me to the Pharaoh. Even Joseph was in his own way trying to defend himself. You can look at all these other characters. Look at Peter. Peter was rightly accused of being one of the disciples of Jesus. And he cursed and he swore, defending himself against those truthful accusations. Look at Paul. Paul stood before Ananias, the high priest. And he defended himself when he stood before Ananias. He went before the governor, Festus. He went before King Agrippa. And he was being judged before them. And again, he defended himself. Now he had a different angle. Jesus was going to the cross. Paul was still preaching the gospel. Paul had a mission and that was his mission was to get the gospel out. But anywhere in scripture, I don't see anywhere where anyone had done anything like what Jesus did, where he willingly laid his life down, where he willingly took these accusations on himself and if that's not enough, Pilate decided that he would just try to help Jesus. He would help him out. He would help him in this situation. He wanted to try to encourage the Jews to make a choice and to release Jesus. And then let this criminal Barabbas take his place and die. Pilate knew that this was not a legit case. When you look at verse 18, you can see that it's very clear to him that this was not, this was not a case where, where Jesus was truly guilty. He said, it says that he knew because of envy that they had handed him over. They were jealous and they were envious of Jesus. They were envious of his wisdom. They were envious of his miracles and everything that he was able to do. Pilate asked a second time. After he asked the first time, his wife sent a message to him. And when his wife sends the message to him, she lets him know that she was tormented in her dream about Jesus and told him, hey, look, I know this is a just man. There is no question about it that this is a just man. And this would be evil and it would be wrong is what she was saying for you to execute him, for you to put him through this torture. And even after his wife intervened, Pilate, this is where he tries to help Jesus. This is where the one who needed no help, Pilate had to try and do what he could to help the situation. I don't know if it was because he really liked Jesus so much, maybe he did, or was it just that he liked himself so much and he was trying to help his own conscience and trying to make himself feel better about the situation. But here, He's doing it. He's doing it. And what Jesus was saying when he said nothing was he was saying everything. I don't need your help. I don't need you, Pilate. I don't need you, elders. I don't need you, priests. I don't need you. I don't need you, Judas. I don't need you, disciples. I don't need you, Peter. Y'all need me. And I need to go to the cross. And you need me to go to the cross. And he was determined that he was going to go to the cross. He was determined that there was nothing that was going to stand in the way. There's not a whole lot that we know about Barabbas. Uh, church history doesn't give us much. Eusebius, the church historian. Josephus, the Jewish historian. 
I, I went and I looked and I tried to find what I could and there's nothing. I can't find anything. If there was anything, there was nothing I could find. There's not much that they say about this Barabbas. But what the scriptures tell us, in this passage we know that he was, he was a criminal in Luke and John's gospel. It tells us that he was guilty of treason. He was guilty of murder. And so all of this made him a felon. And for treason, murder, and felony, it was usually something that would be punished by the sword. But he was still alive. He was still alive. And when you look at, I talked to Pat, when Pastor and I were talking about this, uh, he had made mention about Barabbas and what his name means. And, and I had looked it up. And, and when I went and preached to the prisoners in Centerville, it just didn't really occur to me so much but when I was talking to pastor and we were talking about what his name means, his name means son of the father. And in some trans some places it actually translates son of a master. And so they were having to make a choice between the son of God and the son of a father, the son of some other master. And as we were discussing it over the phone, just talking, it, 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 it came to me. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Is it possible that Barabbas represents the son of Adam? Come on. The fallen race. The fall of the human race. Is it possible that I could say that I am Barabbas? Is it possible that when we look at Barabbas and we look at the community's worst, the community's most filthiest, that's me. That's you. That's us. And Jesus wanted to make it abundantly clear by saying nothing. And he made it abundantly clear. But Pilate was still confused. Pilate still was struggling. He was struggling to get it, to really understand what was going on. Maybe it had something to do with his own conviction. Maybe it had something to do to his resistance to the conviction. Not listening to what his conscience was shouting to him. Not listening to what his wife had gone out of her way to communicate to him. What is it about Barabbas? What is it about Barabbas versus Jesus? They had to make a choice whether it was going to be Barabbas or Jesus. Pilate wanted to see Jesus go free. Pilate went out of his way to cause Jesus to go free. But that was out of Pilate's control. That was out of his control. He was in control, but he wasn't in control. Come on. It should have been so simple if he really wanted to let him go. But he knew that he had to please the people. He knew that there would be a major, major problem if he did not maintain the pleasing of the people. So in his trying to help Jesus, and Pilate knowing that this was not a legitimate case that they had brought before him. He asked that second time, who do you want me to release to you? Do you want Barabbas or do you want Jesus? After his wife had intervened. And what Jesus was saying is that I want to take it for Barabbas. I want to be the one to take it for Barabbas. Pilate goes and he excuses himself. He goes and he washes his hands. And he excuses himself. And in essence, what he said when he said that, let it be on you. This is not on me anymore. What he's saying is that, I'm going to excuse myself. And this is my excuse for myself. I'm going to excuse myself, and this is my excuse for myself. I'm going to give it to you. It's going to be on you. And what do they tell them? Let it be on us and on our children. We'll take it. So he wanted to get off the hook. Did he want to ease his conscience rather than to heal his conscience? If he would have submitted to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, his conscience could have been healed. But instead, his conscience was only eased. 
And what's really interesting is Eusebius, the, this Jewish historian that I mentioned earlier, he records that Pilate actually committed suicide. That's how he died. His conscience was never healed. There's no indication that he ever did get healed in his conscience. It's interesting that Judas committed suicide also. Judas and Pilate. Two, two of the very ones that had the deepest hands in this account. What would be the reason that they would let Barabbas go? He had given them the decision. But what would be the reason that they would let Barabbas go? Was it that they liked Barabbas? I don't think they liked Barabbas. I think they hated Barabbas. But what was really going on is they hated Jesus more. And then whenever I had thought that the Lord had put on my heart and started to deal with me about my love for Jesus and the things that, that I still struggle with within myself, it's not a matter of whether we love Jesus. It's not a matter of whether the church loves Jesus. It's a matter that maybe sometimes the church loves themselves more than they love Jesus. Mm. Luke 9, 23. Luke 9, 23 says, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And that's what Jesus did. That's what he was doing. He was denying himself. Before Jesus went to the cross, Jesus denied himself. He denied himself rather than defended himself. He had every reason to defend himself. He had everything in his favor. He had the judge on his side. He had the judge's wife on his side. But he was committed and submitted to the will of the Father to go to the cross, die to his self-will, and to die on that cross so that mankind could have the option to be forgiven and to be washed in his blood. What Jesus would say to us today is what is it about us? What is it? that still needs to be crucified. And it should, simply is a matter of whether we love Jesus more than we love ourselves. That's really what it comes down to. Is who do you love? Who do you love the most? Who's going to take precedent? Jesus was the innocent one. Barabbas was the guilty one. Jesus is the life-giving spirit. Barabbas was a murderer. Jesus came to unite everyone under God, to unite them back to God. Barabbas had done nothing but rebel against government, against law, against authority, and against God. Jesus came to bring healing, to bring forgiveness, to save the community of his day, the world, all that Barabbas did was he caused problems in the community. He hated what was right, where Jesus was the epitome and the standard of what was right. How is it? How is it that it's so difficult? How is it that it's so difficult for us at times when we can't see it that way? I believe that the, the main reason that we struggle so much is because we're not always connecting with Christ crucified. We're not always truly connecting with him. And the reason I love the passage in Luke 9.23 so much, where it is mentioned and that account is in other gospels, is because that's the one place where he says daily. That's the one place where when he talks about anyone coming after him, denying themselves, taking up their cross and following him. That's the one place where he says that you must do it daily. And so what seems to be the problem in people's hearts and minds is they, are, they have a tendency not to catch or to realize that, man, this is not a one day or a one night stand with Jesus. When you give your life to Jesus, it's a lifelong commitment. You have to give your whole life to Jesus. 
And when we recognize what we are in the light of who God is, and we realize how filthy we truly are, we recognize how disgusting our sin truly is to Him. That our very best is still the filthiest. Come on. The filthiest. Come on, bro. In the eyes of God. Then we can realize that, man, I had him yesterday and things seemed to be going in the right direction yesterday. But today I need him again. And I need to remain connected to him today. And it's no less today than it was yesterday. I was crucified in Christ yesterday. And I need to reflect back to what Christ has done at the cross and be certain that I remain crucified. And if I should depart or if I should stray away, I need to be crucified in Christ again. I need to go to the cross daily. I need to deny myself daily. It's a daily thing. And that's where I believe is a major disconnect in the Christian faith. We have to know this and we have to walk this out. We have to live this out. There's an offshore cohort. Well, it used to be he quit and he took a new job, but uh, he's been saved and serving the Lord for about two years now. And, and, and he told, he's told me many, many times, he said, Aaron, he said, man, and I'm outside of the walking around the platform doing my job and, and these thoughts are coming to my mind and it's just they're, they're carnal and they're fleshly and they're evil and they're disgusting and this guy I, he couldn't put it in the words that maybe I'm saying it now but he understood what it is to crucify the flesh he understood what it is to execute yourself he would pray as he's walking out in the deck and say God take these thoughts and just rip it out of me Rip it out, Lord. Strip it out of me. He said, Aaron, I'd find a place on the platform where there's no one else's, and I'd be yelling it out. I'd be yelling at God or yelling to God, not disrespectfully, but desperately. I need you to crucify this in me. I've been living for you for a couple of years now, and I'm still struggling with it. Wash me in your blood, Jesus. That's what it means to connect with Christ. It's not saying this, 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 and this. It's not a formula. It's connecting with Christ. It's connecting with Him. It's going to Him. What does that look like? I gave you a picture of what that could look like. But that's His story. And that's His connecting with Christ. And He said, I receive forgiveness and I receive the grace of God every time. It's being genuine. It's being sincere. It's connecting with what Christ has done. It's knowing. It's, no, it's a knowing. It's a knowing that there is no other way. It's a knowing that self is not going to get it done. It's a knowing that there is no other options. Yeah. Yes. How? How can this be right for Barabbas to be released? How is this, how is this okay? It's not okay. It didn't have to happen that way. It didn't have to happen that way through Pilate. It didn't have to happen that way. It didn't have to happen that way through the, the chief priests and the elders. Jesus was going to die one way or the other for our sins. Yes. And they made their choice. And they participated willingly by their own choice. They crucified Him. And Pilate, after he washed his hands, going through the motions doing something in the natural and thinking something inside of himself that now I'm free of this. Now I'm good. And then what does he do? He delivers him over to them to be scourged, to be whipped, to go to the whipping post. Wow, Pilate, way to go, man. You did a really great job. You just washed yourself, your hands of it and then you played the advocate for Jesus. And it did nothing, absolutely nothing. And then in the other, uh, the other side of your mouth, you, you turn him over to be crucified. It was supposed to be Barabbas. It was supposed to be us. But Jesus, he didn't say a word for that primary reason. For that reason. So that he could go to the cross and so he could die for us. Singers and musicians. Thank you. Would you stand up with me, please?
Do we love Jesus? I know that we do. But every day it's a matter of whether we love ourselves more or not. Do we hate the old man? Do we hate our old life? That's a question that only you can really answer for your personal life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, I just pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you would just let the Holy Spirit deal with our hearts this morning, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us, Lord, through this story, this portion of the story of choosing between Barabbas and Jesus. I ask, Lord, that you would just give us deeper understanding and revelation, Lord, of what it is and what it looks like to deny ourselves. We know that it's not a formula, Lord. It's not just praying a prayer. It's a lifelong commitment is what it is. It's a lifelong submission to you. It's a life of denying ourselves. It's a life of executing our old life. It's a life of continually to walk in the spirit. Only as the old life and the old man remains executed and crucified with you. When we take up our cross daily, Lord, that is what we are doing. We're taking your cross. We're taking your words. We're taking your commandments. And we're wrapping all of that up in the death of self and the resurrection and new life in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would deepen the understanding of what it is, Lord, to truly walk in the Spirit. Deepen our understanding of what it looks like, Lord, to truly be submitted and committed to you, Lord. I'm asking, Lord, that you would remove all confusion as to what it's supposed to look like. Lord, we have become so like the world in the American church as a whole. We become so, we dress like the world. We talk like the world. And God, this is unacceptable. And even this is irreverent to you. Even this is disrespectful to you. After all that you went through to go to the cross for us, after all that you went through to stay silent, to remain silent and to deny yourself on that witness stand. The least we can do, Lord God, is allow you, Lord, to come in and surgically remove those things, those ways of the world that are in us. And I ask God that through the conviction and the power of the Holy Spirit that each person that's here this morning, Lord, that you would be able to get their attention because God, you don't force your attention or you don't force their attention to you, Lord. I'm asking God that you would draw and that you would just pull them closer to you, to hearing your voice and to listening to you, Jesus, and to truly hearing your voice as you speak. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we know that we can't just pray a prayer and then we're just suddenly completely sanctified and start to finish. It's a lifelong process, and I'm asking God in the name of Jesus that you would just reveal that to us, Lord, this continual connection. This continual connection to Christ crucified, that it is through faith. It's not of works. The result is good works. But the right tool for this job is faith. 
The right tool for this job is faith, and it's only faith.